I'm so happy to be here with all of you to talk about what we believe a Biden-Harris White House would mean to the Asian American Pacific Islander community and how Joe and Kamala's stated intentions and perspectives could impact us. With Asian Americans being the largest growing demographic of eligible voters in the United States, I think this conversation is meaningful on so many levels. Um, so I'd like to introduce you all. I'm going to borrow this from Mo Rocca, who hosted a previously uh, shared Broadway for Biden town hall. Please introduce yourselves, tell us your hometown and um, a stage or film role that you've had that made you feel really empowered. Um, I'll start, I'm gonna go alphabetically by first name, Diane. Oh gosh, that's me, hello. <laughs> hello, <laughs> Diane. <laughs> Diane Phelan. Um, my hometown right now is New York City. Uh, I've been here through since the beginning of us being shut in. Um, and a role, I was thinking about this question, a role that makes me feel empowered. I would have to say it's any role that I was cast on traditionally in because it made me feel that my um, my voice as a human being was being uh, put over the color of my skin. And so that's always made me feel really empowered. Great, thank you. Reggie. <gasps> Oh, R is before T, I forgot that. <laughs> it is. <laughs> um, hi, uh, uh, Reggie Lee. Um, hometown, so many hometowns. Currently Los Angeles, uh, born in the Philippines, raised in Ohio. Um, a, f uh, a, a role, I, you know, I, uh, I agree with you, Diane, with all that stuff in terms of being cast non-traditionally. I think that's fantastic. It's happened to me several times with more with film. I feel like, I feel so privileged to be amongst you because I haven't done a Broadway show in over 20 years. But um, I think a role is, uh, I was on a, uh, a show on NBC called Grimm and come the third season, they asked me if um, there was any Filipino folklore. And I said, are you kidding? The Philippines lives on folklore. <laughs> so uh, here they, so they created an entire storyline um, and I believe it was the first full fledged Filipino storyline uh, on network television. So I felt very, very proud of that and happy to be a part of it. Thank you, Telly. Hi, I'm Telly Leung. I am a native New Yorker. I was born and raised in Brooklyn, New York. And, um, you know, they always say you never forget your first. My first Broadway show was the revival of Flower Drum Song on Broadway, which was a revisal that was written by David Henry Huang. And he sort of took the show that was the Rodgers and Hammerstein classic show from the golden age and sort of made it about the immigrant experience and the experience that first eight minute number where you see Chinese immigrants coming from China, from mainland China to San Francisco, that mirrored my parents experience coming to America. So for me, that was very empowering just to be in a broad, a be in a Broadway show in the first place. And, and, and then also be in a Broadway show that, that mirrored my family's, you know, immigrant experience. So um, that I would say that that was very empowering. Thank you. And I guess I should say, I'm Christine Toy Johnson. <laughs> um, I hail from Katona, New York. And uh, I was thinking about this too, that um, Flower Jump Song, certainly I did the first national tour as Madame Liang, and that was the first uh, you know, Asian American character I got to play in musical theater, but also um, playing uh, Sherry Yang in, in Marvel Iron, Marvel Netflix's Iron Fist because it was the first time I played an Asian American woman with so much power. So mm -hmm. thank you for those introductions. Um, as we've heard Joe say, he wants to build back better. And to me, part of that would be bringing the importance of unity back into our national conscience. And as he said, valuing people from every culture and every nation. The, I don't have to tell you this, but the long history of xenophobia in this country has had a hand in trying to simultaneously erase and vilify us as a monolithic culture since the 1800s. And this has been especially amplified during the pandemic. So it's been for me so inspiring and frankly life affirming to see Joe Biden and Kamala Harris value our community as an integral part of the fabric of America. So I wanna talk a, a little bit more about unity. Uh, Joe has clearly stated that he believes that every member of the AAPI community should be treated with dignity. And my assessment is that this holds true whether you were born here or you immigrated here because he actually recognizes that we're a nation of immigrants. I'd love to know what other ways you would like to see the Biden-Harris team building back better. 
I'm going to start with backwards, Telly. Yeah, well, I think if COVID has taught us anything is that a virus doesn't care what skin color you are. It doesn't care if you were born here, if you immigrated here. It's affecting all of us. And I think for the last four years, there has been this movement to isolate ourselves as a country and to think, you know, we, that, that we can do this by ourselves, that we are going to take ourselves out of cl climate uh, climate agreements. We're going to, you, you know, we're, we're, we're going to keep everything within ourselves and, and not have to deal with other countries. Well, then COVID happened and we realized, oh gosh, we all affect each other actually. And I think, you know, of, of course, COVID is a, is a healthcare issue, but it's really, you know, I, I think, I think healthcare is sort of the, one of the major things that I, I would like the Biden Harris ticket to build back better on because it is something that is affecting all of us, you know, healthcare to me is a right, is a right for all, not just for the few that can afford it. I really do feel like they are going to start making the sort of steps to have a public, a public Medicare option for all, um, that they're going to work on getting generic drugs to be affordable to everybody and that they're going to penalize the drug companies and the lobbyists for trying to make those cost, uh, 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 cost, um, prohibitive for people that can't afford drugs. So if anything, you know, there's no way there's it's if we only cured the rich of COVID, we're still we're not going to get rid of this problem. You know, it's something that affects all of us, every race, everybody in the world, every socioeconomic level. So to me, I think I think one of those build back better things has got to be health care. And I feel very passionate about that. And I think Joe and Kamala do, too. Thank you, Tilly. How about you, Reggie? Um, uh I think dignity is actually something that is, for me at least personally, should be a given, right? In terms of any any ethnicity, and it, it, it unfortunately hasn't quite happened uh, recently and in the last four years. So beyond that, I would like to see it taken a step further, um, a celebration, an amplification of our voices, of our traditions, of our humanity, of, of our strengths, so that people actually get to know who we are, kind of acquaint people with who we are. But I think the biggest thing that I would like to see more is a celebration of the AAPI community versus just being treated with dignity. Thank you. Diane. Mm -hmm. I love everything you guys are saying. You guys are both so well, all so well spoken. And uh, just to piggyback on all of that, for me, I was just reading um, about on Joe Biden's website, which has been an incredible resource for what the very specifics of their plans are. And I was so shocked to learn of all the um, the plans they have for education. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's more about what I'm excited to see possibly happen. I mean, Joe's, Joe Biden's plans to for AP, API communities is to cancel tuition for any families under who are making under 125k that's huge to me okay that's huge and then and then he there's also a response for um co like covid response for student loans for canceling 10 grand for student loans i mean for me for me moving forward it's all about education it's all mm. about educating everybody it's all about having um having an america that can think for ourselves and isn't just like regurgitating headlines on facebook so so for me i want to see i want to see inclusivity in 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 taking care of api education minority education and um i i would really like to see them make good on the promises that are on their website right now and it's it's exciting it's really exciting what they have laid out like anything is feels like <laughs> 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 like I'm all this stuff and I'm like, exactly. actually, all of it sounds great. Let's do that. <laughs> right, right. Yes, thank you very much. I want to talk about Kamala Harris. Uh, of course, she is the first person of Black and South Asian descent to run for vice president. Yay. Yeah. And, um, and Joe Biden has made a commitment to increasing AAPI voices in leading government positions. Let's talk about what it means to you to see greater representation in the government. How how might this impact your own sense of belonging in the country? Seeing an AAPI in a position of power is uh, not something you see very often in, in the United States. There's actually a stigma, and I think it is 
And I was researching this once, like doing a role that was in a position of power. And someone was interviewing me about like being in a position of power, being Filipino Chinese, you know, on television. I said, well, it doesn't happen very often, you know? And so it, there, there is this uh, akin to the model minority myth. It's like there's a stigma that Asians lack leadership qualities. And I actually did research on this and found that this was very true all across the board, what people were saying and thinking. So to see Kamala up there, uh, really helps me gives me a, a great deal of self-confidence and and I, I feel like i'm being heard and represented so i think it dispels that myth completely great i know what representation means to me in our sort of microcosm of show business you know had had uh, for all of us who are who are speaking right now had we not seen somebody else who looked like us on a stage do it you know i i i, I don't know if i would be here today speaking on behalf of Broadway for Biden, Jimmy, I don't know if I'd be on Broadway, you know, had it not been for seeing shows like King and I and Miss Saigon and, and the movie of Flower Drum Song and seeing people like George Takei not only be actors on television, but, but, but activists and politically active. So for me, it's, it's all about representation and having somebody mm -hmm. like Kamala, I think will have reverberations for generations to come not just for the African-American community and the black community, not just for the Asian community, but also for the mixed race community mm -hmm. too. So uh, to me, it's, um, to me it's, it's sort of momentous, you know, because she's, she's the shining example of, oh yeah, I, I, some, some kid generations from now goes, I can do that too. Yeah, absolutely. And as someone who, um, I, I run something called Broadway Diversity Project on Facebook and Instagram, and it's all about highlighting representation with the idea of letting, of, of the idea of making more of what you see grow. So it's about, for me, it's like about saying, when I see Kamala up there, um, it's all about saying, we have a right to have our voices heard. We have a right to have our, a seat at the table. It's it's so incredibly powerful when you see someone's face that looks like yours. You it gives you it makes you feel a sense of belonging. It does something so intense for your identity. It's it's um, it's really it's it's an amazing thing. Yeah, thank you. I think someone I, I someone once said, um, "Don't try to get into the room. Know that you are the room." Uh -huh. And I think that that is certainly um, the case here. It is. It's very. It's very empowering and encouraging uh, to just be included and treated with respect. Yes. Frankly, um, okay. So um, the 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 Obama Biden administration. Uh, re-established something called the White House Initiative for Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders. And um, Joe has pledged to build on what they started uh, to really address specific issues that the, the community uh, experiences. I'd love to know what your thoughts are on um, some of the most important issues to you pertaining to, of course, the, there is, it's a very diverse, wide community, but the AAPI community that you might like to see addressed in this initiative. To me, it's about engagement. So I think, you know, I, I grew up with immigrant parents who, you know, they, they still live in Brooklyn, they live in New York, but, you know, they are blue collar, you know, they worked in garment factories and they worked in Chinese restaurants. So for them, you know, living a life as an immigrant in America, sort of middle class life, uh, they, you know, their idea was always, well, the, the nail that sticks up gets hammered first. That's like always the very, you know, traditional <laughs> saying, right? And so they sort of kept their heads down and were not politically engaged because frankly, you know, no, political matters didn't, re first of all, they sort of felt like their vote didn't count or they sort mm. of felt sort of invisible as as a, as Asian Americans in this country, right? Even when they got citizenship, they were they weren't always politically active. And I think, if anything, I I, I think this generation coming up is, of, they're going to feel differently about that because, as we can see, you know, we're we're doing this discussion not live, you know, not being politically active and having leadership that is incompetent. You know, this is this is the result of it that we can't be in person having this discussion right now. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So like, uh, so all of a sudden, I feel like there is. There is this thing that has happened now where even my parents who are normally not engaged in politics, we talk now and we are engaged in politics. I, mm -hmm. And that's something that I find sort of remarkable. You know, they're getting older, so healthcare and Medicare and all, all social security, those things are important to them. So to me, it's about getting 
the Asian community very involved and very vocal and whether that means, you know, get, getting young college Asian groups to register their campuses to vote, you know, getting more Asian people in student government so that and getting them involved in grassroots sort of political movements. Maybe that's maybe that'll hopefully be the change for future generations to come. But I think it's about engagement. I think it's a it's a step away from sort of what our parents experienced, you know, which was put your put your head down, you know, work hard, make money, don't get too involved in anything too controversial or political and and just keep and just keep going, you know. And I, I think we no longer can be in that position. We we are not in the position that our parents are in anymore because we're you know, we're affected right. by politics. Right. And I think that in order to engage people, the people need to know that they are that they belong and that they will be listened to and that they do matter to the the government that that is trying to engage with them and we're and we're a growing electorate that's the other thing too mm -hmm. we are a that's quickly right. grow, that's the right. asian population continues to grow mm -hmm. and so you know we can't look at our parents and go oh they weren't vocal you know what i mean because that's like now we actually have to be we have we have to make politicians from here on out pay attention you mm -hmm. know to our concerns so we sort of have to take a different tactic and i and i'm and i'm thrilled that that the biden harris that they're going to continue really having a forum for for asian people and really listening to them in the oval about their concerns so that's it's exciting let's continue with this this line of, of thought um reggie do you want to chime in here yeah you know i'm hearing so many uh, first of all me doing this first of all thanks for having me do this because it really educated me i mean i started reading all these things that i've never never knew before you know this white house this white house initiative i knew about before uh but just to read all the points and the specificities of it all was really enlightening and telly listening to you it's like there's so many common denominators about everything that we're talking about and what i'm hearing a lot is representation and visibility you know and and that's it, it's almost like a common thread because people don't know who we are. <laughs> so no one can engage. And, and what you said about your parents, and I was going to talk about that later, is that everything has to hit on a personal note. And it starts with your family, you know? And it, when it hits on a personal note, I feel like that's when you go out and do something. But this White House initiative is, is so much about, at least what I read about, economic resources and economic empowerment. And what I'd like to see with that, again, it comes full circle with visibility. So specifically what i'd like to see in terms of our business and where we are is there some sort of funding government or otherwise that can help all these people now that want to tell our stories all these people that have oh, production yeah. companies and are writing plays could there be something government funded with that so that it does come full circle again to the visibility so whenever we're visible in the public eye Everyone seems to engage. You know, I see someone like me voting. I see this, I see that. So for me, in terms of economics, I think it serves the economy well if we were a little bit more visible. So if there could be some sort of funding that could help attribute to that, I, I would love that. Mm, thank That's you. That's brilliant. <laughs> Diane, go ahead. I honestly have nothing more to add to that because um, these two guys are brilliant and saying everything that I would want to say. So, but I really agree. I really agree. You know, it's all about uh, the thing that kind of, uh, as I was doing my reading for this panel was, it was all about that um, outreach is important. What I learned from the um, AAPI data um, and um, Asian Americans Advancing Justice had put out this uh, research that they were seeing that both parties hadn't um, hadn't been haven't haven't been reaching out to the Asian American Pacific Islander base, and I think uh, you know this idea that we keep talking about inclusion and dignity. It's it's about it's about really acknowledging us and making sure that we are you know reached out to. And I think Reggie, you're, what you just said about about like funding, you know more funding these projects that are like Asian American based is, is an incredible, is an incredibly great idea. It's something I would have never thought of. And I think that's, if we can get people to let the, let the Biden Harris um, ticket know that that's important to us, that would be amazing. Okay. And I, have, and I just want to add that, you know, I, I was talking to some of my friends at APIA 
uh, vote dot org. Mm -hmm. And they were saying, listen, you might feel as a New Yorker, which usually swings very liberal, that your vote doesn't matter. But actually there is at the end of it, whoever wins this election, there is a tally of how many Asian people voted. And I think what Diane is talking about, which is that both parties sort of haven't, they don't really know how to reach out to the Asian communities because we haven't come out to vote in numbers that have been significant for them for them to pay attention, you know. Unfortunately, in 2016, only 49% of us who were eligible to vote actually came out to vote. That's mm. crazy. Like, yeah. if, if you were mm -hmm. to tell, you know, I mean, I, I hate to harp on a stereotype, but if you told an Asian kid we got a 49 on a test, that's not acceptable. <laughs> you mean, like, come on. Like, so, so, like, uh, seriously, it's like w in, in, we're underachieving in that way. And, mm. and I think, so no matter what, you might think, right, I'm, you know, it doesn't matter. My, my one blue vote in a very red, place is not going to matter because it's going to go red or my right. very blue vote is not going to my is not going to matter because we're really blue actually the tally of it is act does matter maybe not for this election but, but maybe not in your particular county but it's gonna matter because if the numbers are there they go oh my gosh there's a lot more asian people in america right now like we should listen to them i, I would i would agree with that i think it's about you know i think the questions being posed of what what do we want to see them do and a lot of the work that i've been doing right now with unapologetically asian and racism is a virus is we just launched our um our asian votes count campaign yesterday which is kind of just um exactly what you're saying telly is to get to get our communities to know the, the importance of our numbers. And I saw, Telly, that you had done um, a, a promo for the census. I think yes. you're doing it with Gold House about the census. And it's all about like, Asian Americans also need to partake in the conversation of what it means to be American, right? So it's all about saying, okay, in what ways do we get to be counted to knowing that the individual, the individual voice is as important as our collective voice and that we are responsible for using our individual voices to be counted, to like say, oh, it, it, it feels like it's overwhelming. It feels like it doesn't matter, but like, yes, these numbers are being tallied. So every time you can make an action or talk to your parents or talk to your family or your friends and say, hey, let's go out and do this together. Let's make a bo voting plan. Let's do our research. You know, I mean, um, this thing that we're doing here is an example of individuals coming together to using our platforms to and, and our voices to speak. And, you know, like, as Reggie said, it, having to do this, this panel, like, I was like, wait, let me read up what's going on here. What exactly? Yeah. What exactly is Joe, Joe Biden and Kamal Harris up to? So I had to kind of really do that. But it, it's really also taking about accountability onto ourselves as a community and saying what we need and, and making our voices heard. Agree. And how do we how do we do that? Right. How do we do right. that? Exactly. Because I feel like I feel like so much of what we're talking about is a cultural and be generational. So a cultural in terms of like what Telly was saying is like, don't rock the boat. You know, I was always right. taught to not rock the boat. Yes. I was, I, but I am seeing a younger generation now of AAPIs that are out there in my niece. I mean, she is just, she's so vocal. She wants to go out and protest. She wants to go out and do stuff. You know, my parents would never, I, I, I'm surprised to hear how many older AAPI community of the community don't vote actually. So yeah, it's great. It's, 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 and then how do we do that? At least everyone's, you know, you're doing something about it, which is fantastic. Right. Well, I think that that's, it does speak to uh, a voter apathy across the country. And, and also you mentioned this, Diane, and, and I've been thinking about this a lot too, the individual individualism versus collectivism and how it seems to be really sort of out of whack right now. And, um, and how I think the individual people don't feel like they can have an impact on the collective uh, conscience and that that is absolutely not really true at all. Um, so yes, I, I agree that it's so important to figure out ways to not only step up ourselves, but to encourage and inspire our communities to, to join in together. Um, Telly, do you want to talk a little bit more about AAPI vote? I'd, I'd love to share that information with our people who are yeah, watching. It's, it's an incredible, it's an incredible resource. And I, I, I think it's, um, they're, they're, they're a national nonprofit organization and they're, they're, you know, it's not, they're not partisan at all, but they're really just trying to get out the vote get as many Asian people engaged in politics as possible um, all across the A AAPI population. They are apiavote.org. Great. They're, they're great. Thank you. Apiavote.org. Yeah. Great. Thanks. Oh, so, you know, you can't talk about the pandemic without talking about the 
anti-Asian rhetoric and hate crimes that have um, really been uh, just disseminated in through through this current administration. And um, Joe Biden ple has pledged to fight against this. Um, I, I'd love to know, I know we all have experiences and, and, and many opinions about it. I'd love to know your thoughts on how uh, you would like to see Joe lead the nation in fighting against not only anti-Asian rhetoric, of course, but the, the prolific uh, amount of just xenophobia and, and anti-anything other uh, rhetoric that's going on. I'd love to jump in. Um, as you guys know, I've been doing a lot of work with racism as a virus. Um, thank you guys all for your support with that. Um, I just want to say, I, I know I know we're trying to focus in on what what Biden and Harris are going to do and, and be excited about them, but just anything that they're going to do is already better than hmm. than a, a sitting president who is is clearly actively trying to divide us. Mm -hmm. Every, all the language, even just the language that's being used in, in the Biden-Harris campaign is already, um, is already respectful, mm -hmm. you know? Um, but in terms of what specifically can be done, um, I, what I personally would really love to see is different legislation for hate crimes. Because right now, in order for something to be categorized or charged as a hate crime, there is a, cert, there, there is a really um, specific standard of things that doesn't take into account hate crimes can be committed against people who don't know the language, could be hard of hearing. Um, as we just recently saw with the Bensonhurst grandma who was burned uh, in, in Brooklyn, we, we started a huge um, campaign about it to get the NYPD and the Brooklyn DA to to change it to a hate crime, and they wouldn't because apparently they they interviewed this like ninety year old grandma who doesn't speak English, mm. um, and said, "Oh well, uh, you know they they didn't they didn't say anything hateful about her about her ethnicity, so therefore it, we can't charge it as a hate crime." And it's just been ridiculous to people because the not having it as, as counted as a hate crime is is erasure. It's erasure mm -hmm. to our community and erasure to the story of what's been happening in our communities. So um, that was what we ran up against when we were trying to uh, rally for this cause and lobby for this. And, and to me, it's about if they're really serious about um, supporting minorities, um, supporting communities of color, then there will be um, then this this issue of, of how you charge a hate crime should definitely be looked at. To me, it's just about and I can't believe we have to say this, but it's about the fact that words do matter. So, you know, already, I mean, you, you say like, uh, I think Joe Biden's already already doing it. Yes. You know, like the way he speaks, the way he speaks about this pandemic, you know, the way he speaks, the way he scientifically talks about it he, in a truthful way. He, he's not here to sort of BS anyone about what this is and, and, uh, and what, what, what the virus is. And, you know, I, to me, it is, that helps. That helps sort of go, oh, right, this isn't, we're not going to try to scapegoat one particular group and blame them mm -hmm. for this thing that has happened. Like, you know, which, which is exactly what's, what sort of has been happening mm -hmm. this last year. You know, that's all it really is. It's, it's a, it's a, you know, we as actors know exactly what it is. It's a, it's a cover for, <laughs> for your own, for his own insecurities and inability to lead, right? His own inadequacies. So you cover by scapegoating and blaming someone else. But I don't know. I, I think it's about the fact that words matter, science matter, and building trust again. Mm -hmm. Building trust in your leaders again. That, you know, what, what they say is going to be true. I think, you know, that's... But I, and I think he's, they're already doing it. They're already doing it. My, my, my blood pressure goes down every time I hear him speak. So it's... <laughs> I, I know yeah. that's it. that's yes. Okay. Yeah. Reggie? I think, I think I just, I mean, piggybacking on all that, all of it, fantastic. You know, racism, it's all of us like a... A, a stake in the heart. I grew up in Ohio, so it was a particularly Caucasian community, and I was bullied from the from the get go. And it, 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 you know, that goes away again on a personal note. That goes away after years of building with with you guys and the Asian American community. And then, of late, all those feelings have come back. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, it is just what's going on. And I was like. Wow, I have lived in this country for over 40 years and it's I, I'm feeling it now. So I think 
once and yeah, they are doing it already. And and I'll, I would just like to see a, a public address decrying the use of these of these again semantics, the use of these words, these these particular words in general. Uh, and what Diane said about public outreach, um, legislation, the policing of hate crimes is a huge thing. It needs to be better policing of hate crimes. Uh, education. I mean, education is huge. Just encouraging tolerance. You know, I think that's a huge, huge thing. Everything these guys have already said. But, um, you know, it hits us all on a personal note. It's huge. Thank you. Let's let's talk about anything anything else that's that is really <laughs> pressing. No, not anything else like besides this. I mean, <laughs> anything else that is pressing to you? The, there are so many issues that um, that we are facing that we need to um, we need to really reexamine and set back to. Like I said earlier, uh, bringing a, a sense of unity and decency back into the national conscience and what that means. Um, are there any other uh, specific? issues that you'd like to talk about. This is, here's your chance. I mean, uh, so many from climate change to healthcare. I mean, those are the two big things that I feel, uh, first of all, healthcare, um, specifically in our industry with SAG-AFTRA suddenly mm. doing this thing with the, um, uh, how much you have to make in order mm -hmm. to, I mean, they, they, they just took away two tiers of, of, of healthcare. Uh, that was helping a lot of people, uh, you know, um, especially yeah. us. I feel, I feel, you, I, I, I'm, I'm proud to call us working actors. You mm -hmm. know, that's what we do for a living. But that almost took away a lot. It took away a lot of people's insurance. So affordable health care is one thing that I would like to see addressed specifically within our community and climate change. I mean, you know, I, I'm, I, it's, it's, I think the air quality is about at a little bit less than hazardous outside right now. <laughs> from all the fires going on here. So if that that's that's got to be addressed big time, um, especially for the West Coast here. Mm -hmm. So those are two things that I feel like Biden Harris would knock out of the park. Mm -hmm. uh, so many things I I um, <laughs> I I fear and this is an, that there is going to be a, a campaign of disinformation that comes out mm -hmm. in October. And I think it is um, it is it is upon all of us to make sure that that you know that things that are factual, that numbers that are factual, the things that are scientifically proven, that we continue to um, that we continue to to promote those things because I also know that there's going to be a barrage of disinformation that comes out, whatever October surprises that come out, mm -hmm. and I think it is it is all of our responsibility to make sure that we really research those facts, that when we get the, you know, when we get something that we don't share it right away, that we make sure it comes from a credible source and all of that, because I, I, I feel like our, our democracy depends on it, mm -hmm. you know? So, um, and, and, you know, social media is a wonderful thing. It can also be, it can also be a very dangerous thing. I, I implore everybody to go out and watch The Social Dilemma, which is a, a great mm. documentary that's on Netflix right now, which is about the bo both sides of this. But that, you know, I, I really think that we all have to, at the end of the day, and, and I'm hoping that with the Biden-Harris administration that we get closer to this, that there is one truth, <laughs> that there that things that are, that numbers, there's no debating numbers, facts, and truth, that there is, there that there is, that news is news right. when it's proven, and there is not fake, you can't just call something fake news, you yeah. know, so we, yeah. we can't And then work, make it so, yeah. Right, we can't work. As a mm -hmm. country, we can't work off two sets of facts. That, right. That's just going to divide us. So um, I, I, I'm, I think that we all have to be really on our guard this October as we, as we A, get out the vote and, and get our Asian brothers and sisters and siblings out to vote, but also B, really be wary of the disinformation and call it out. I just keep thinking about how important it is for everyone to realize that we are, I don't want to sound, I don't want to sound crazy. Like the words that are, the words that are wanting to come out of my mouth are like, this is, this is, we are battling for the soul of America. We are battling against a dictator. This, we're battling against someone who is, is constantly trying to spread lies and to try to um, put a spell on everybody. I'm having arguments with friends and family. Um, I had a family member who, 
literally use the word China when the Chinese virus is over. This is a Filipino person, okay, wow. who use and I said, hey, you know, um, respectfully, this is not. I spend almost all my time getting people to stop using this phrase because of the harm it causes our communities for people that look just like me. And this person's response was, we have to hold them accountable. I'm like, this is just regurgit, this is, this is regurgitating Fox News. This is regurgitating um, like rhetoric. So I just, I think it's just so important for all of us to, you know, use this time in this quarantine, this great pause to really go inside ourselves and ask ourselves what we really feel, what we are really seeing, because this, this we're, we're in a dangerous territory, mm -hmm. and Joe Biden is the best, is is the way out. He is the yeah. way out. I mean, all these things are all these things we're talking about are so important, but. I, my red flags go up when you're arresting journalists, when you're removing mailboxes. I mean, we've been, his, you know, he, his method of, of his, like, his playbook has been out of the art of war. Like, every, everything he's doing, where it's like, let me just make something crazy happen and then drop this little piece of information so that you have, you, you're like frog and of a frog in boiling water where things just, like get worse and get worse. And then we just were desensitized to things. So many things are red flags and we just have to know that we have to, no matter what, use our individual power to affect what we can, which is definitely our vote. And yes, educate yourself and, and get excited about the Biden-Harris ticket. Because if you don't, we are the only people that benefit from, another, from four to five taking another term are white males and that and that's it that's that's it so there's there's we we have a dictator we, we're in emergency mode so um that's just the thing that's on my mind and and i and i don't know if everybody is on i mean everybody here of course is on that page but i don't know if people realize how dire this situation is if we do not get this president out of office now we have to vote in overwhelming numbers that's right. just it yeah, I think that uh, we do battle this, like I mentioned earlier, this national empathy yes. uh, when it comes to voting. And um, I know this will sound like a very obvious question, but uh, I'd love to know why imp why voting is important to you. And, and building on that, what kind of ideas can we generate to inspire other people who might not feel like their voice will amount to anything? How do we inspire them to know that, that it absolutely does matter that they vote? I mean, I think this goes back to uh, what I said earlier and what we've all said is that it has to hit on a personal note and it yeah. starts right at home. I really do because Diane, you talk about that. I mean, seriously, my family is like, it's, 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 it's interesting how many don't vote. You know, it, it does, it does, they don't feel like they matter. Again, a very cultural thing there, but it is education. Education, this man, I, Joe is like, if there's anything that I can feel without him even saying a word is a, a whole ton of compassion. Mm -hmm. And if there's anything that we need right now, it's a whole ton of compassion. But I do feel like we have mobilized so much more than if all this didn't happen. I mean, I don't think we would be here saying what we were, what, what we're saying. So on the positive end of that, I feel like it's great. We just got to keep going. We got to keep the pedal to the metal, especially right now. Ex Diane, exactly what you were saying. You know, it's the time. It's the time to educate. So um, getting things out, and again, dangerous but very helpful. Social media is such a huge thing. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, it is such a huge, huge thing. Anytime I film something that's get the vote out or, or vote for this person, vote for that person. I mean, it doesn't go anywhere. It's social media is where it goes. And that's that's kind of getting the word out. So if there's anything that we can do individually and collectively, I think it's that. And, and just exactly what everyone here is doing is creating content that acquaints people with who we really are mm -hmm. individually right. on a personal note. I think that will affect everybody else. I do think Diane touched on something that, you know, voting is always important. Voting sh should always be something that matters to you. 
this particular vote is special. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. This particular vote is not ordinary because I don't think, you know, I, I, there, are, there have been certain presidents that I've not agreed with politically, but never have I doubted their intentions to be a public servant. They might, mm-hmm. they, they believe in America. They love mm-hmm. this country. They might want to take this country in a different direction than I want to take it in, you know, but I don't doubt their motives of why they decide what they do. This is actually a time where I, I actually look at, look at the person in the White House and I go, I don't think the country's interests are at his heart. Yeah. Like that's not first on his list, mm-hmm. right? So, so, and when it comes time to voting for a Biden-Harris ticket, I think the choice is so obvious because Joe Biden has a, has a record of being a public servant. Mm-hmm. He has a record of being somebody who has always been empathetic and compassionate, has reached out to communities beyond himself, has reached across the aisle to make things work when he was a senator, has the diplomatic skills to reach out to other countries and, and allies to make sure that, that we're all in this together. So uh, I, I don't know. I mean, uh, to me, it, it is a very obvious choice when you just mm-hmm. look at the kind of human being you want mm-hmm. in an office. I've never had, I don't think there's been an election where I've doubted somebody's character as a human being. Like this one, I actually go, okay, like, my gosh, like we're, we're deciding between, you know, we, we really are deciding what kind of human we want in, in, the, in the office. It's a very different election. The vote, you know, as I said, always important, but this one is, this one is, you know, I, I think do or die. I, I, you know, thinking about what you just said, Telly, about what kind of human being we want, you know, I, my first election that I voted in was the Bush Kerry one. And um, that was enough to make me not want to vote again because I felt like it was such a close call that it made me feel like my voice really didn't matter. And as a young diminutive Asian um, mixed race person, I just already felt like my voice didn't matter. No one valued mm-hmm. what I had to say. Um, And so it took me a long time to realize that we all do matter and that this is exactly what 45's um, administration wants is that they want us to feel like we don't matter. That is, I'm I'm just going to say something, but that is what the system known as white supremacy is based off of. That is what it, that is what they're upholding. So um, this it's about saying this is the only thing that can be American, and the rest of you need to be silenced, put in cages, um, ignored, um, uh, stigma stig- discredited. Um, it's about you know discredit is the new death, right? In this in this day and age, it's all about mm-hmm. like silencing all of you so that it can only be this one voice, and it's not, and and that's just not true. We have the power. And that uh, we the people, right? I, I really believe in America. I know everyone has this feeling of, of oh God, who are we now? And I never say that. I say this is the great American experiment. You know, we are a country of immigrants. We have a lot of trauma that we're all working through, and no other country in the world is doing what we're doing. This is going to be messy. This is going to be hard. But I mean, for me, it's like a beautiful um, symbol of what the world can be. All these different races coming together to try to find how our similarities, try to find who we are. And and that's why our individual voices matter because we go into the mosaic of creating this. And like, it's a fallacy that, that you think that your voice doesn't matter is a complete fallacy. We need to come out in numbers so that there's no question about who wins. And it needs to be, it needs to be Biden-Harris. It needs to be. Yeah. Yeah. There was something about um, 45 saying that he was taking out the diversity training because it was un-American. Mm-hmm. And, and what you talk about, you know, this is American. I mean, what America is like a land of immigrants. So right. I, I just don't understand. <laughs> I don't mm-hmm. understand. You're taking away the education that we just talked about. But yeah, this election, so important. We are all Americans. Well, I want to thank you all for being here today. It's been such a really enlightening and inspiring conversation um, takeaways. We we matter, our votes matter, our voices matter, Every everything we can do to get this ticket uh, voted up is what we need to do. Absolutely. And I, I'm wishing all of you who are watching uh, good health and open hearts, abundance, and uh, get out the vote. Thank you.